most famous ship in the history of the world been discovered at last. The Gilgamesh epic paralleled exactly the story of Noah in the Bible. There is plenty of ancient historical evidence spanning nearly 2,000 years that the Ark is on Mount Ararat. The location of the mystical Mount Sinai itself is the subject of relentless argument. The biblical story of the burning bush is completely true and totally provable. It must have seemed to Moses that God was asking him to do the impossible. In the book of Matthew, we're told that the graves were opened and the bodies of many dead saints were raised to life. During the night, all of Sennacherib's army had been struck down by some kind of plague. Mary Magdalene was a woman of independent means and spirit. For nearly 2,000 years, she's inspired millions of people, especially women. The grail is believed by many to be the cup containing the wine that Christ associated with his blood at the Last Supper. According to the legend, only Sir Galahad was able to reach it, dying in a moment of transcendental glory. The sound of pottery shattering caught his attention. The curiosity of the world was ignited. The Dead Sea Scrolls date back almost 2,000 years. Along with the many papyrus and leather scrolls was a scroll made of copper. As Herod's men attempted to open the tomb, a blast of flame filled the chamber and drove them back. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered in together into one place. And, let and the, the stars of heaven earth. fell unto earth. Thousands of abandoned vehicles littering the roadway. The calls keep coming in. The full Complete chaos is the only way I can describe the situation. Here. For the great day of his wrath is come. It turns out that Bible prophecy has an unparalleled record of accuracy. The focus of the conflict lies in the destiny of Jerusalem. This will be the last great battle and one in which God himself will eventually take part. You'll be amazed at what has been discovered. The year 2000 comes weighed down with prophecies of the end time. Scholarly forecasts of doom and thousands of years of warnings and predictions that unavoidable catastrophe is upon us. January 1st of the year 2000 was the beginning of a new year, a new century, and a new millennium. All certainly good reasons to celebrate. But should we be celebrating the beginning of this particular millennium? or approaching it with feelings of trepidation. As the year 2000 approached, the incidence of major earthquakes around the world was increasing almost geometrically. Could this be a sign of the end time, foretold by centuries by the ancient prophets and by Christ himself? The Old Testament prophet Daniel warned that in the last days, there would be a time of trouble such as there never had been since there was a nation. Are we now beginning to see these events come to pass? In the middle of the 20th century, after 2,500 years of exile and being dispersed throughout the world, the Jews were returned to their biblical homeland, exactly as the prophet Ezekiel predicted. Is this the event that signals the beginning of the end? The new millennium, will it be filled with promise, or will it fulfill the promise of Armageddon? Are these just stories from the ancient past, or will these prophecies of the end time be fulfilled in our generation? In the next hour, we will examine some of the prophets and prophecies, ancient and modern, as they relate to the year 2000. We'll also see what the scientists can tell us about the immediate future and what we can look forward to in the fateful years that lie just ahead. We will examine closely the events that appear to be putting the fulfillment of centuries of prophecy in motion. For thousands of years, biblical prophecy has warned of a vast array of cataclysmic disasters, and an apocalypse 
that will destroy most of the world and its population just prior to the millennium. But are we sure it is this millennium? More to the point, are we sure the new millennium has begun? January 1 of the year 2000 has a nice ring to it, but the new millennium actually starts January 1 of the year 2001. This year is actually part of the waning moments of the second millennium. But then again, maybe it isn't. It all depends on which calendar you're looking at. There is the Hebrew calendar, which is a lunar calendar and undoubtedly the calendar that the ancient biblical prophets would have had in mind when speaking of things to come. According to the Hebrew calendar, this is the year 5760, which means there are still 240 years before the full 6,000 years are up. Then there's the Julian calendar. This calendar begins with the reign of Emperor Diocletian and was widely used for centuries. But Pope Gregory felt that it was unsuitable and commissioned Dionysus, a sixth century monk, to recast the calendar so that the years could be counted from the birth of Christ. Unfortunately, the monk, also known as Dennis the Short, miscalculated the birth of Christ, leaving us four years short. Nevertheless, what became known as the Gregorian calendar, the calendar we use today, became adopted. And the millennium actually began January 1st of 1997. So we have either missed it already, or it's still 240 lunar years into the future. Or could it be somewhere in between? In any case, when we begin interpreting the signs of the times 2000, we would do well to remember that the year as it appears on our calendar is more of a reference point than an exact date. The term signs of the times comes from the book of Matthew in the New Testament of the Christian Bible, when Jesus told the Pharisees, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. We are in much the same position as the Pharisees, facing what many believe to be the end time or last days, but still facing the same question. Can we interpret the signs that are supposed to point to the prophetic warnings? It is apparently a matter of some importance since approximately 23% of the Bible is devoted to the end times. In the Old Testament, the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi speak primarily about the last days. In the New Testament, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, and 2 Peter are devoted to such teachings. And of course, virtually all of the book of Revelations focuses on the end of the world as we know it. What are these signs that are at once so important that more than a fifth of the Bible is devoted to them and so apparent that we should be able to recognize them? Aren't Bible predictions just age-old myths, as skeptics claim? It turns out, in light of recent world events, laymen and serious scholars alike are now wondering if perhaps it is possible that events as predicted in ancient Bible prophecy truly do come to pass. It turns out that Bible prophecy has an unparalleled record of accuracy. This is especially remarkable considering the large volume of prophetic scripture it contains. In the Bible, there are a thousand specific prophecies recorded, which 668 have been fulfilled. None have errors and an amazing amount of scriptural prophecy directly addresses the dark and terrifying period known as the last days. Recent events in America, in the Middle East, and throughout the Arab world have brought enormous renewed interest in Bible prophecy, particularly that which deals with warnings of the final days. So just what are the end times as described in the Bible? Exactly what is predicted to happen? The end times, often referred to as the last days, is a period of great tribulation, the Bible says, a time of great upheaval and unrest around the world, both politically and socially, a period which also experiences unparalleled acts of natural disaster. All this precedes a bloody clash of opposing ideologies with deadly and profound consequences for every living thing on earth leading to a final all-out battle between the forces of good and evil known as Armageddon. The prophets of both the Old Testament and the New Testament have given us specific signs to look for concerning end times. About 85% of those events 
have already taken place and perhaps the most important of the signs of the end times have occurred in our lifetime. Since 1948, dozens of biblical prophecies have been fulfilled. Many point to the coming of the last days. It is no coincidence that the focus of world events is on the conflict in the Middle East, just as it was when the New Testament prophecies were written. How can experts be so certain of the relevance of recent world events to the timing of the coming last days? And just why is the year 1948 so important to biblical prophecy as it relates to the end times? Two key events in recent history have set the stage for all the biblical prophetic forecasts that were and are to follow. First was the seemingly miraculous return of the Jews to their ancestral homeland with the founding of modern Israel in 1948. For many historians and political observers, this was an unlikely occurrence. This prophetic event had been 2,500 years in the making. The second key event occurred as a result of the 1967 Six-Day War between Israel and the Arab neighbors. With Israel's victory, it took back control of Jerusalem, the historic location of the Jewish temple twice destroyed in the past by hostile conquerors. Prophecy tells us it will be the eventual rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem that occupies another significant, long-predicted chapter in Bible prophecy. The focus of the conflict lies in the destiny of Jerusalem and Israel's inability to maintain a lasting peace with its Arab neighbors points up the prophecy in Luke 21, 24 that Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This obviously involves the Gentile nations of the world, including America. Can it actually be true, as some prophecy events claim, that the terrorist attacks on America are linked to the end times scenario? Even by the most conservative interpretation of Bible prophecy, let there be no mistake, the September 11, 2001 terrorist attack on New York and Washington, D.C., and the greatly increased hostilities between Israel and the Palestinians are all signs of the approaching biblical end times. The central conflict played out in end times prophecy is exactly the key issue that's been fueling the Middle East crisis since 1948. The Muslim world disputes Israel's claim to a homeland in what is present-day Israel, a territory which the Arabs considered a sovereign, independent nation. End times prophecy basically says this conflict between Israel and the Arab factions will continue to expand until most major nations of the world are drawn into this deadly showdown with worldwide implications. The Bible specifically indicates that escalating conflicts in the Middle East set the stage for all the end time events that follow. Ezekiel prophesied that the graves of the Jews would be opened and they would be returned to their ancient homeland and their temple will be rebuilt on the holy site. The first part of that prophecy has been fulfilled in stunning detail. Among the most obvious of these signs today as described in the Bible is the promise of war and rumors of war. We are to expect a time of tribulation such as there never has been since Israel was a nation. We are told that a time will come when all things that are good will be called bad and bad things be called good. A flaming mountain will crash into the sea with devastating results for all of mankind, and a star called Wormwood will poison a third of the world's supply of water. A great leader will be swept onto the world stage. He will establish a new religion, require everyone to accept his mark. He will demand that he be worshipped as God and those who refuse will be killed. Christ himself warned of earthquakes in diverse places, famine, pestilence. And finally, we will see all the armies of the world gather together against Israel on the plains of Armageddon. This will be the last great battle and one in which God himself will eventually take part. These are not all the signs, of course, but some of the more prominent ones. And certainly, they are signs we should be able to discern if indeed we are approaching the final hour. But that's not all we have to worry about. There have been other prophets over the centuries that have written about what many believe to be our day. 
A pious Catholic priest named Malachi O. Morgan lived nearly a thousand years ago and wrote what has come to be known as the Papal Prophecy. In it, he named every pope in succession from 1134 to what he describes as the last pope. Since its publication, the Papal Prophecy, for reasons that will become clear, has often been compared to the predictions of Nostradamus, whose warnings and forecasts often had much to say about the popes. Over 400 years ago, Nostradamus wrote of air travel, submarines, royal and presidential assassinations, the French Revolution, both world wars, and the popes. None of these prophecies could have even been imagined in his own day, yet he committed them to paper with full confidence in their accuracy. But when Nostradamus was a young man, those who dared to express the prophetic gift were burned at the stake, so he wrote his predictions in enigmatic quatrains. Some of these word puzzles have remained unsolved to this day. History has unraveled most of them, however, and found them to be stunningly accurate. Nostradamus was a Jew who became a Catholic on pain of banishment. The King of France ordered all non-believers to convert or leave. Whatever its origins, Nostradamus seems to have embraced his Catholicism wholeheartedly, and his affinity with the popes is legendary. On one occasion, walking down a muddy path with his son, Nostradamus suddenly stopped, took the hand of a poor monk, and kissed it. Father, you make us look like fools. Then why is that? Because Brother Peretti is a monk of low birth, only lately delivered from a pigsty. My son, it is required that you yield and bend a knee before His Holiness, the Pope. Come on. 45 years later, 19 years after the death of Nostradamus, the lowly swineherd became Pope Sixtus V. In 1555, 40 years before the discovery of Malachi O. Morgan's prophecy, Nostradamus published several predictions outlining the fate of the popes his quatrains closely resemble the vision of Malachi. Both of them, for example, describe John Paul I as the moon and John Paul II as the works of the sun. But it is their agreement on the events surrounding the last pope that is particularly striking, even down to the name. Malachi was expansive in his description and very clear. Peter the Roman will lead his sheep to pasture in the midst of numerous tribulations. The city of seven hills will be destroyed. The twilight settles, indeed, the depth of night before the promised dawn. Nostradamus characteristically couches his prediction in more obscure terms, referring to the last pope as the rock of the church, which in Catholic teaching would be Peter. Both men agree, however, that there will be great tribulations and a man named Peter will serve as the final pope. Nostradamus, in fact, in one of his more direct quatrains, writes, O vast Rome, your ruin is approaching, not that of your walls, but of your lifeblood substance. Like Malachi O. Morgan, he sees not just the fall of the pope, but of the city as well. And if Malachi and Nostradamus are correct, there will only be two more popes. These prophecies were written some 600 years apart, yet the accuracy of their previous predictions and their amazing agreement on the last pope gives us pause. What exactly does lie ahead for our generation? Is it possible that prophets 2,000 years ago saw the wars and plagues of the 21st century? And why should we be particularly concerned about this century anyway? While Nostradamus's predictions have had a degree of accuracy, they are not considered scriptural, and as such are not recognized by the Christian church. When it comes to accuracy, no one can hold a candle to the biblical prophets. Their record of prophecy is so far unblemished by any failure. Over 400 prophecies regarding the birth and life of the Savior were fulfilled in every respect. And many of us are witness to the fulfillment of prophecy in our own time the prophecies of Ezekiel being just one example. But then the ancient prophets were judged by a different standard. In ancient times, men called prophets had only two choices. They either were correct or they were stoned to death. Short-term prophecy was a risky business. 
you either had to be remarkably accurate or remarkably lucky. There doesn't seem to be any reason to suppose the biblical prophecies regarding the final days before the second coming will be any less accurate. Still, is there anything that points to this millennium, whenever it begins or began, as being of special significance? Well, for one thing, we're coming to the end of nearly 6,000 years of Earth's probation, according to the Bible. But more importantly, the prophets of both the Old and the New Testament have given us specific signs to look for, events that will occur in the last days. Now, some of these have already taken place, but perhaps the most important one has occurred in our lifetime. Some 2,500 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel, speaking for God, said, O my people, I will open up your graves and bring you up from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. He went on to say, I will take the children of Israel out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. And then he concluded, I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and there will be one king over them. This is one of the most remarkable and specific prophecies of all, and many of us have lived to see it happen. Now in the context, the opening of the graves refers to the national restoration of Israel. And on May 14, 1948, just 50 years ago, the Jews became a nation in their own land. I believe the prophecy of Ezekiel is being fulfilled to the letter. Secondly, Jesus Christ predicted there would be a dramatic increase in the number of earthquakes worldwide in the last days prior to his return. Now in the first decade of this 20th century, there were three major earthquakes of a 6.0 or greater magnitude. Since that time, there's been a steady increase, especially in the last 20 years. For example, from 1980 to 1990, there were 310 major earthquakes. From 1990 to 1994, there were an astonishing 747 6.0 or greater magnitude earthquakes around the world. Surprisingly, most people seem concerned not so much with if these things will happen, but when they will happen. A thousand years ago, many people thought they would be witnesses to the end of the world. Why that was, we're not quite sure. But today, millions of people the world over point to the biblical evidence that seems to point to this generation as the end time. But does the Bible give us conflicting messages about interpreting the signs of the times? Jesus had admonished the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, for not understanding and paying attention to the prophetic signs of the coming of the Messiah. He said to them, in effect, you understand the signs of the weather, you understand the signs of the seasons, but you've misunderstood the signs of the coming of the Messiah. Yet Jesus also warned his disciples that no one would know the day nor the hour of his coming, only the Father. In fact, even the angels do not know the precise time of the coming of Jesus Christ. On the one hand, Jesus seems to be saying that we should be able to read the signs of the times and know what these signs portend. On the other, we are told that no matter how carefully we study the matter, Christ will return at a day and an hour when he is least expected. There is really no conflict between these two admonitions by Jesus. I believe the Pharisees were looking for a sensational supernatural sign. And Jesus was saying the signs of the times as found in the Bible are enough. Jesus, in fact, is calling upon us to live each day as if he could come really today before the day is done. On the other hand, he commands us to occupy and do his good business until he comes. So we must plan and work as if we have a hundred years. Still, the question first asked by the disciples hangs in the air. Master, when will all these things happen? Are we any nearer to an answer? Few prophets, ancient or modern, have ventured anything like a precise time for the beginning of all these events. But Isaiah did offer some clues. He said the very earth would reel to and fro like a drunken man. Is there any indication that might be happening? According to geologists, this area between the Fiji and Tonga Island groupings has always been one of the most seismologically active locations on Earth. But in 1967 and 68, something extraordinary happened. Massive seismic activity was registered here. Entire islands appeared and disappeared. On the other side of the globe, as far back as 1959, a Reuters dispatch from Athens reported water levels in several Greek harbors had dropped far enough to expose the seabed. And in 1975, 
Mount Etna erupted. Since that sudden and surprising volatile event, the Earth does seem to have taken on a life of its own. Earthquakes continue to increase at an alarming rate. Volcanoes, new and old, have increased their activity, while sea levels have dropped precipitously in some areas. Could it be that the increase in volcanic activity, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, earthquakes, floods, and other natural disasters actually herald the beginning of these Earth changes? Could it be that the prophecy of Isaiah did in fact pinpoint the beginning of the end? In my view, the literal fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy regarding the return of the Jews to their homeland in 1948 signals the beginning of the end times. It seems to me the signs of the times are with us, in fact have been for a while. If the prophecies foreshadowing the end of the world have been and are now being fulfilled, what of those prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled? Virtually all of them have worldwide implications. John the Revelator, for example, tells us that in the last days, the stars will fall from the skies. And the stars of heaven fell unto earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Could such a thing happen? Biblical scholars insist the prophecies will be fulfilled literally and that all of them are certain to come to pass. Furthermore, Nostradamus warns that earth-shaking fires will cause tremors around the new city and the sky will burn at 45 degrees. Fire approaches the new city. New York City, it seems, is also in jeopardy. But from what? Can modern science provide any insight into how stars and fire might fall from the sky? Scientists claim about every three to 5,000 years that Earth passes close to a great meteor shower or asteroid belt. And this can go back to the uh, <clears throat> Sumerian writings that were written about 4,500 years ago. And they claim that a heavenly body called Nibiru uh, crashed into a planet located between Mars and Jupiter. And this planet was called Tiamat. And after this collision, the moon of Nibiru divided this planet Tiamat into the planet Earth and asteroid belt. If the astronomers are right, we may all see the fulfillment of at least one of John's prophecies. But what of the Nostradamus warning that fire would burn New York City at 45 degrees? The SOHO Solar Observatory satellite has been monitoring the sun's activity for the last several years. The spectacular eruptions on the surface of the sun, all the particles that are sent streaming out towards the Earth. A number of things happen uh, when these particles get near the Earth. Uh, we see spectacular northern lights in the nighttime sky. Radio communications are disrupted. Even electrical transmission is in danger. Solar activity is on an 11-year cycle and it's gonna reach its next maximum in the next year or two. But that wasn't the case in 1989. Then a huge solar cloud slammed into the Earth in eastern Canada with disastrous results. Unable to absorb the massive electrical charge of the cloud, power lines were overloaded, and in a matter of minutes, the power grid was shut down. So great was the cloud's electrical force that power lines remained loaded and intermittent flickering was noted even after the power stations went offline. In 1989, the sunspot activity caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. The experts tell us that next time, sometime in the year 2000, the damage could be far worse. But is it just natural disasters that mark the last days? Or can we look for man-made catastrophes as warnings of the end time? Modern science seems to confirm the possibility that the ancient warnings could indeed materialize. So what exactly do we have yet to look forward to? Let's turn to the book of Revelations. In chapter 13, beginning with verse 16, John speaks of the great beast that will have all power in the last days. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is a man's number. His number is 666. What John seems to be describing in considerable detail is a cashless society. Is that a possibility in our lifetime? 
Credit cards are marvelous things. These little pieces of plastic make it unnecessary to pack large sums of cash or write out dozens of checks. Just swipe it through the card reader and instantly your bill is paid. We're all familiar with the barcode system for checkout. It's currently in use in practically every retail outlet in our country, as well as most of the technologically advanced countries around the world. But does a technology exist that would make it possible to simply pass the laser reader across the back of your hand or forehead? And what would the laser be reading? Different translations of the Bible disagree, by the way. Some say the mark will be on the hand, others say in the hand or forehead. There are a number of groups that are promoting the advantages of a cashless society. And the steps between a credit card or debit card and having a mark on your hand or forehead are few indeed. There are very few in order to buy or sell, especially under pain of death, that would resist receiving such a mark. The fact is we're a lot closer to being there than most people want to believe. The vast majority, probably upwards of 85% of all transactions, are already cashless transactions. To take it a step further, if all of us were to demand cash instead of journal entries of one kind or another, there'd only be enough cash in existence to cover 5% of the transactions. Since the advent of computers, many people have tried to discover the identity of this beast with the number 666, but without success. He is usually associated, however, with another of the biblical signs of the times, that great world leader who will be welcomed, adored, worshipped even, but who will eventually become the most vicious and bloody dictator in the history of the world. The man who will be called the Antichrist is prophesied to be of Middle Eastern origin, but he will rule from Rome. This man looms large on the stage of human events during the last days. So far, no one of that stature can be found anywhere on the world scene. Could it be that the ancient prophets simply missed the mark on this one? Given their record of unblemished accuracy, I wouldn't want to second guess the prophets, whether it's Daniel or Ezekiel or even Christ himself, because they spoke of a time of great tribulation, a time in which you would have nation rising against nation, of wars and rumors of wars, of great commotion and upheaval and of pestilence and famine. And they spoke of one other event that I think we're on the verge of seeing fulfilled. The prophets of the Bible foretold of the revival of the ancient Roman Empire and the generation leading up to Christ's return. Could such a thing be happening? Are the nations of the new European Union beginning to fit Daniel's description? The BBC interviewed Belgian Foreign Minister Henri Speck a few years ago about the 1957 Treaty of Rome and what they proposed to accomplish in the European Union. We felt like Romans on that day. We were consciously recreating the Roman Empire once more. Point of fact, the Maastricht Treaty that Spack was talking about forms the world's first superstate. Let's face it, what a colossus, the economy, uh, an allied army, uh, things much larger than the United States. And I think it's going to be an awesome situation that we don't even realize today. The stage, it seems, has been set. Now the only thing required is for the central character to step into the spotlight. And we should remember the prophets warned that power was given him over all kindred tongues and nations. Is it possible that one man could gain such absolute global power? The prophets provided an answer to that question too. The answer is in John's revelation about the mark of the beast. Total control over commerce, buying and selling, will bring about total control over every aspect of life, including religion. As for overcoming national sovereignty, the elite who support one world government have already suggested that it only remains for the right crisis to occur for people the world over to accept the notion that we will all be better off under a single worldwide government. It seems obvious, even to the casual observer, that the increasing power of the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, and the World Court are rapidly destroying traditional national sovereignty and replacing national political goals with a global economic agenda. Astonishingly, the global elite have admitted that this is their goal. Henry Morgenthau, Treasury Secretary under President Franklin Roosevelt and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, acknowledged it was their plan to, quote, financially bankrupt the international machine. If you think modern global politicians have softened their stance, consider the UN study recently sponsored by the Ford Foundation. 
written by Sir Brian Urquhart and Erskine Childers and published in 1994, this study boldly states that the UN General Assembly, the Security Council, the International Monetary Fund, the World Health Organization, and the International Labor Organization should all be transferred to one central location in order to centralize political control and improve overall efficiency. The study further states that, while there is no question at present of the transformation of the UN system into a supranational authority, the organization is in a transitional phase. The study repeatedly uses phrases such as the gradual limitation of sovereignty or chipping away at the edges of traditional sovereignty. There are those, it seems, who are bent on making the prophecies come true. But are these indeed the signs of the times? Christ was impatient with those who he said could easily read the signs of the weather, but were either unwilling or unable to read the signs that were given them by the prophets. Can we be accused of the same thing, or will our global technology help us to get a better read on the people and events that the prophets have fixed as warning signs of the last days? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus tells his disciples what will happen at the end of the age. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He also warned of other catastrophes. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of the birth pains. The message is clear. There will be a series of events of ever increasing magnitude that we should see as signs of the greatest event of all, his return. And while the earth groans, we can look for society in general to dwindle in unbelief. In 2 Timothy, Paul warns, There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. 700 years before Christ, the prophet Isaiah pointed a finger of warning, and he said, Woe unto those who call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Today we are witnessing as never before in history that those who try to follow the teachings of Jesus are being laughed at, mocked, even persecuted. And yet the teaching Jesus said, which are evil, are now being glorified and applauded by the elite. But Isaiah adds another warning. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Have we become too wise and clever for our own good? What signs of the times could we be overlooking or perhaps ignoring? More importantly, is there anything we can do about it? In the early 1960s, the United States Supreme Court, through a case brought by Madeleine Murray O'Hare on behalf of her son, William Murray, struck down teacher-led school prayer. It further banned all religious expression, including any display of the Ten Commandments from public schools on the grounds that it violated the First Amendment. Before 1962, polls among educators listed the primary problems in public schools as talking, chewing gum, making noise, running in the halls, getting out of turn in line, wearing improper clothing, and not putting paper in wastebaskets. In just 20 years, 1982, the top public school offenses were rape, robbery, assault, burglary, arson, bombings, murder, suicide, vandalism, extortion, drug and alcohol abuse, gang warfare, pregnancy, abortion, and venereal disease. Today, those problems are not only unabated, they are getting worse. Could it be that the generation described by Paul is now being raised up? And there's more. John the Revelator prophesies of some truly cataclysmic events that will occur shortly after the opening of the seventh seal. The description of these events is so horrific that most of us tend to simply ignore them, but there are signs. 
According to chapter 8, verse 8 in the book of Revelations, something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. On June 16, 1999, the BBC reported that a newly discovered asteroid, a kilometer in width, was heading toward Earth and would miss by only one-tenth the distance between the Earth and the Moon. It is due to arrive in 2027. Shades of Nostradamus. Scientists in 1999 discovered an asteroid about a half mile wide, and researchers at the Smithsonian Biophysical Observatory calculated on August 7th, 2027, that this asteroid would miss the planet Earth by about 23,000 miles. Other scientists are quite concerned that when it makes its next pass in 2039, that there could be a collision due to the gravitational pull of this asteroid uh, by the planet Earth. Astronomers warn that a collision is only one of a range of possibilities for this chunk of rock. And according to a report in CNN Interactive, if it did hit the Earth, it would have the force of two million atomic bombs. John also tells us that a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters. It is entirely possible that the next generation will not have adequate amounts of drinking water. Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health has been recommending for years that countries begin to conserve water. Approximately one-half billion people in the world presently do not have adequate amounts of drinking water, and it's predicted that by the year 2025, approximately two billion people or more will not have adequate amounts of drinking water, which is over a third of the world's population. Before we write that off as a problem for third world countries, consider this. A CBS News report in January of 2000 indicates that 46 of the 48 contiguous states have drinking water that is contaminated by a gasoline additive mandated by Congress for the purpose of cleaning up the air. It makes the water bitter, smell like kerosene, and it is deadly. Incidentally, Chernobyl, translated, means wormwood. Dare we ignore the signs of the times? Another prophecy dealing with the last days has largely been lost amid the noise of war and rumors of war. Daniel, Isaiah, Zedekiah, and Jeremiah all speak of the destruction of Babylon, but they also describe it as a great and powerful city. When Nebuchadnezzar reigned in Babylon 2,500 years ago, he left his legacy on cuneiform tablets so that those who would follow him would, would rebuild the temples and the palaces that he constructed in ancient Babylon. The Bible says that as part of the ancient times, just prior to the Battle of Armageddon, ancient Babylon, the wickedest and yet the most powerful city of the ancient world, will again be rebuilt to assume a major role in end time events. Saddam Hussein has been rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon just as it was during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And to commemorate his building of the city, he actually held the Babylon Festival. As part of the Babylon Festival, he had a medallion made. As you can see in this medallion, he put his picture beside that of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he made it so that he and Nebuchadnezzar even looked alike. Few would argue that Saddam Hussein sees himself as a man of destiny. And by making Babylon a great city once again, he would secure his place in history. But Hussein is probably ignoring the rest of the biblical prophecy that says this glorious new Babylon will be destroyed in a single hour. We have only touched upon a few of the dozens of prophecies that are regarded by many as signs of the last days, but the signs seem frighteningly clear. If the prophets can be believed, the end time is very near. Jesus repeatedly encouraged his followers to pay attention to the prophetic signs of his return. In fact, in Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, then lift up your head and look up because your redemption draws nigh. That being the case, there is one more sign we would do well to watch for. This is the sign that warns of the last great battle that marks the true end of the age and the beginning of the millennium. Ezekiel speaks forcefully of a great army that will appear on the scene in the last days, pouring out of the land of the north and led by a prince named Gog. 
Most scholars agree that the invasion force will be a multinational coalition headed up by Russia. The ancient term Meshach actually refers to the modern city of Moscow, and the ancient Tubal refers to the modern city of Tubalsk. But Ezekiel also warns that they will bring with them Persians, today's Iran, Libya, and Ethiopia, and in the latter years, they will seek to annihilate Israel. But will Russia, a current ally of the United States, be leading the attack against Israel? Just where in the scriptures is this unique alliance between Russia and the Arab and African nations spelled out? It was Ezekiel who predicted that a nation to the extreme north of re-established Israel will become that country's arch enemy. It will be a nation with a vast arsenal which is used to arm the allied Arab and African nations. Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 20 refer to this country by the name of Magog. The ancient people who are called the Magog are commonly believed to have been the ancestors of the Russian nation. Russia is the only individual nation to the north of Israel capable of carrying out a well-armed, multinational organized assault on Israel. It's generally considered a former superpower but is still the second or third most heavily armed country in the world. Since the end of the Cold War, Russia seems to have taken a more peaceful stance. Why would it engage in what is certain to be another major world war? Has Russia's attitude toward the Middle East and particularly the Jewish state softened? And why is it that throughout all of these foretold events depicting the end times, there was no mention in prophecy given to the role played by the United States. What could possibly happen that would keep America on the sidelines during this critical final battle between the forces of good and evil? Since an end to the Cold War was declared by the major powers, Russian belligerence seems to have given way to a more conciliatory position. The days of pounding a shoe on the table at the United Nations appear to be gone. Does this mean the consequences of the Magog prophecy have been avoided? Or could it be the inevitable has just been postponed? Despite its more recent cooperative attitude toward America, Russia's communist ideology has not faded away. Russia has a history of playing both sides of the street. Late in 2001, Iranian Defense Minister Ali Shamkahani and his Russian counterpart Sergei Ivanov signed a bilateral defense and military cooperation pact. This agreement paves the way for up to 300 million a year in arms sales to Iran, who of course is a sworn enemy of Israel. The Book of Revelation predicts another world power will enter the final end times war with an army of 200 million soldiers. This entity is referred to as the Kings of the East. John the Revelator adds considerable detail to Ezekiel's account. He says that the army will be considerably larger than any army ever assembled. In a striking example of how prophecy can be read in today's headlines, in April 1961, Red China boasted they could field an army of 200 million soldiers. Ezekiel says Gog will come with many nations, a great horde, like a cloud that covers the land, and they will seek to annihilate the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. The ensuing conflict is predicted to leave one-third of the world's population dead. The destruction of Israel will seem assured, but at the last minute, the Lord will step in and wreak a terrible retribution upon the forces of Gog. The world, according to the prophets, ancient and modern, is now politically and geographically aligned to see the prophecies fulfilled. But is there any definitive way to tell when that battle will begin? In Daniel 9, there is a prophetic timetable. It speaks of 70 groups of seven years each, or a total of 490 years. The clock began ticking when the command went out to rebuild Jerusalem after having been destroyed by Babylon. It has stopped the day that Christ rode into Jerusalem to proclaim himself as the Messiah the King. That was exactly 483 years to the day. 69 of the 70 weeks are now used up. The prophetic clock stopped at the appointed time and Daniel described a gap between the 483 years and the final seven years of the prophetic timetable. During that gap, the events that were once prophetic have now been confirmed in history. 
and we are now looking for that clock to start ticking again. According to the Bible, the Middle East conflict will continue to escalate and it will threaten world peace. And at that time, I believe that the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist will solve this problem to make him the number one person in the world. The future world leader or future Führer will make a strong covenant with the Israelis and under his protection, the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem and the law of Moses of offering and sacrifice will be reinstituted. The prophet Daniel makes it very plain that an Israeli leader will make a treaty with the European Union and that constitutes the beginning of the Great Tribulation, lasting seven years. The climax of this Great Tribulation is the Battle of Armageddon. Perhaps we can interpret the signs of the times, at least some of them. The question is, are we willing to face the reality of the events that are foreshadowed? Today, we can sit in front of our computer or TV and see and hear the voice of prophecy being fulfilled. With the help of scientific knowledge gained over the centuries, we can now quantify the prophecies about changes in the earth. But other things are more difficult. Generation after generation of people around the world have tried unsuccessfully to eliminate war. Now, even as we struggle toward what seems to be the inevitable final battle, success seems no nearer. If these are truly signs of the times, is the devastation that is predicted for the world a certainty? Is there a way to escape the terrible things to come as a result of the rule of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast? Is science and technology powerful enough to devise a means of avoiding the supernatural disasters John saw in his terrifying vision? Or is this the generation of the last days? As we seek to interpret the signs of the times, we should remember that the predictions of the Old Testament prophets have been proven true down through the centuries. That fountain of prophecy is now and has always been available to all people in all times. For those who are willing to listen, no one is left without the benefit of a warning voice.